Good morning and welcome to CAVE Webinar Wednesday. Today we're looking at safe, practical and aesthetic roof wall and floor access solutions, CPD with Tom Brandon. This CPD will explore the key considerations when specifying safe, secure and functional roof ceiling, wall and floor access solutions, ensuring the highest standards in fire performance and legal compliance without compromising on aesthetics. My name is Shanika and I'm the Training and Learning Administrator here at CAVE and I'll be acting moderate as moderator for this morning's session. We like to make our webinars interactive, so we do encourage you throughout the session to send in any questions as we go along, which we will address at the end of the presentation. If you're watching us live, you can use the side panel to send in your questions. Alternatively, you can get in touch with us via the social links now on screen. Let me introduce today's webinar speaker, Tom Brandon. As a specification sales manager at Access 360, Tom is responsible for managing Access 360's extensive client base across the diverse portfolio of roof, ceiling, wall and floor access solutions, including access hatches, smoke vents, ladders, riser doors, access panels and floor access covers. Tom specialises in working with architects, specifiers and contractors to ensure successful specification across all diverse range of products. Projects. If you give me a couple of moments, I'll just hand over to Tom and he'll begin shortly. Okay. Uh, Tom, you can now share your screen. Yeah. Yep. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Really appreciate you taking the time to spend it with me to talk about what we're going to talk about today. Um, so to introduce myself, my name is Tom Brandon. I am the Southern Specification Sales Manager for Access 360. And as Shanika said, today we're going to be presenting Safe Access All Areas, an essential guide to safe, practical and aesthetic roof, ceiling, wall and floor access solutions. Um, presentation today lasts around about 45 50 minutes as uh, Shanika said you know please feel free to ask any questions on the on the uh, on the uh, chat box there and I'm sure we'll have some time at the end to go for any questions that you have so let's make to, let's make a start so this slide here so this introduces the access 360 group of companies which includes Bilco UK profab access and how green as well so Bilco, very well known in the UK, um, all to do with roof access hatches. We have standard sizes, st different structure opening sizes, very unique to whatever you require to get up onto the roof safely. Um, and we look at this in a bit of detail today, you know, what size hatch do you need with the right ladder? Um, your smoke ventilation side of things, what do you need the structural opening to be to achieve your one metre free vent area? And we look at ladders and, and generally roof safety products today to sort of take you through our range offered from Bilco. Um, and then Profab in the middle here, this is, we're going to really sort of talk about this today. We're going to depth about fire rated riser doors. We look at wall and ceiling access panels and we touch on steel doors as well and the benefits of using steel doors and where to use those instead of timber mm -hmm. and then lastly we look at how green so how green again very well known in the uk very highly specified um specified a lot well did a lot on cross rail so all the floor access into any underground airports major transport uh, projects how green is very well known and we look at the different types of uh, floor access as well there okay so we're going to start off today with roof access we're going to look at natural smoke ventilation we're then going to look at fire rated riser doors why should you pick these over timber door sets and the benefits to you and your clients of doing that we're going to touch on access panels which again very simple very easy to use maintenance free and aesthetically, they look nice and clean. We're going to touch on steel doors, as I say, benefits over, over using these over timber doors as well, and where to do that. And then finally, we're going to look at floor access, you know, selecting the correct product at an early stage and making sure that we 
understand the floor finish that are going into these floor access panels, which is obviously very important, and how we can aesthetically try and hide these as much as possible, as you see in this picture here, one of the underground stations that we've done here. We've got a multi-part unit here. We've tried to hide that as much as possible so the architect can visually keep the aesthetics there nice and clean. So obviously, you know, the biggest thing with us is that we try and get specification right. We try and get involved at an early stage. And, you know, specification can be difficult sometimes. You know, we're going to look at some examples now where that specification or that communication of design hasn't quite followed through. Um, we've got some rather silly examples here and sort of a little bit over the top, but in our industry, you do find things that do go wrong. Uh, communication breaks down or specification is not right. So this is some examples that are a little bit over the top, but fun, you know, this has actually happened. These are real life situations that have actually gone wrong. So let's uh, have a look. So as you can see in this image here, um, so this door has actually been fitted upside down. No idea um, where on earth this has been installed upside down or why, but clearly a complete breakdown in communication, but this is obviously not what you want. We've got an external application here. So I actually thought this was a Photoshop when I first saw it, but when you look at the handle there and the Euro profile cylinder as well, you can actually see that this has been installed intentionally upside down. And I've been told that this was for a person in a wheelchair so they could see who was at the front door. Now, something to point out here is that your household insurance requires the door to be installed as per the manufacturer's recommendation. So installing the door upside down completely invalidates the household insurance. So obviously that's a big, a big issue and a big no-no. This one's ridiculous. Um, here we've got a classic example of the drawings not being updated and being passed onto site. So They've come along, they've installed the fire escape, but they forgot that in fact that they've moved the doors across for the penetrations. Again, absolutely ridiculous, massively over the top, but that is a real life situation that's actually happened. This is one of my personal favorites, you know, great example of the installer mixing centimeters with inches. Um, don't think anyone would want to use those cubicles. And lastly, you may laugh at this one, but this we see a lot, especially the Bilco side of things. You know, when thinking or specifying access solution, you need to think about the day-to-day -day usability as it's not just the access itself, but what's the space actually being used for. So how often is, are you going up there to use it? What are you going up there to use it for? Do you need to take tools? Is there sufficient room to achieve your design? Um, so yeah, so we need to we need to think about this in general. We need to get involved at an early stage and find out what's the best access up to that higher level that you're trying to get to, and make sure that we're we're uh, uh, making sure that we've got all the regulations and standards in place as well. Okay, so let's move on to roof access. So we're going to look at access hatches. We're going to look at ladders, internal and external, and then we're going to slightly move on to natural smoke ventilation. So here is your sort of two classic scenarios of a basic access hatch. So this one here on the right hand side, this is your classic standard flat roof access hatch. So this has a bill clip on it designed to sort of feed your membrane through, which obviously makes it waterproof. Um, you will also see here a provision of a ladder up safety post, which assists the entry and exit off, off the roof. So you can imagine, the user will climb up the ladder. They'll use this handle here to release the uh, latch of the access hatch. We've got compression springs in each corner here to open up the hatch, assisted opening. So very, very easy to, to open. And then we can withdraw this ladder up safety post, which is actually fixed to the fixed vertical ladder, the top two rungs it's bolted round. And this enables you to release this ladder up safety post, lock it into position, and then we can use this to hold on to keep your four points of contact to get up onto the roof. And then obviously coming back down, you've got this to hold on to as well. You can imagine if this wasn't here, what would you hold on to to get, find your feet back on the ladder, go halfway down and then obviously close the hatch. So this really does enable you to be quite safe coming up and down the ladder, which is obviously the most important thing that we need to try and do. 
And once we come back down, we, we get halfway down the ladder, we can then withdraw this ladder up safety post with a little catch, this slides down and locks back into position. And then we grab this red handle here to close the hatch accordingly. So that's very important. That's, that's a very standard hatch. This, this size hatch is around about 915 by 915 is a structural opening. And this would be for infrequent access to the roof. So this would be a single person going up the roof, say two, three times a year to attend the gutter, TV aerial, that type of thing. The other images here is that sometimes the architect wants to try and hide the aluminium lid of the uh, access hatch. And we've cladded this particular one to blend in with the rest of the roof. I think this was Glasgow Transport Museum that we did. And then we've, we can also put our hatches on a pitch roof. That's no issue. There is a, a, a maximum pitch that allowed, I think it's something like 40 degrees. So we can do pitched access hatches as well. Uh, we look at these in a little bit more detail going down the, the presentation. But yeah, that's the sort of most basic access hatch that you can get for infrequent use up onto the roof. So we're going to look at the different areas now of access hatches. Um, so again, this is that classic roof hatch again. As I said, the most common standard size or the smallest size that we do as standard is uh, 760 by 915. This one is 915 by 915. Um, but this will get you up onto the roof safely without any tools, literally just going up there on an infrequent basis two or three times a year. For more frequent access, um, we may want to use the roof up and, and down the, the roof as an escape. Um, we might want to be able to take tools up onto the roof to deal with air conditioning units or PV panels. We, we may want to use the access hatch for, for product replacement as well. So if we've got PV panels or, or any larger items that we need to get back down into the building, we could use this service stair access hatch. You can see these are a lot bigger. So this dimension is around about 760 by either 2.4 or 3.3 as standard, but we can do these any structural opening sizes are special to suit your project. So that's not a problem. We can, we've got some larger compression springs now opening this larger hatch. So again, works in the same way as the smaller hatch. One person can open. The compression springs take the weight. It's very, very easy to open and we can climb up onto the roof and back down. Now this, particular staircase use would be a permanent staircase. So this would be a concrete staircase or a large companionway that's fixed. It's there all the time and it allows those people to take tools up there and product replacement. So that's very important. The size of the roof access hatch, it now needs to be sufficient so that you maintain a head clearance of two meters. So this is detailed in building regulations part K. So this is exactly the same as you would have in a domestic or a traditional staircase, we now need to maintain that two meters from the face of the tread up to the roof access hatch itself. Um, so yeah, so the options are there for that, but that's that's what we're finding a lot of people going for now when we need to get up onto the roof on a frequent basis. If we wanna go up again a little bit more often, if we want something between that smaller access hatch and the service stairway access hatch, we can do a companionway access hatch that you see here. Um, so this is now 1500 structural opening by about 760 and we've got a companionway ladder here. You can see that these are sort of a more a, sort of an angle to climb up. We've got handrails either side to assist you to have that balance of getting up. We can take smaller tools up with us and we've got the head height as well. So we need to now make sure that the size of the hatch with a companionway ladder should also be sufficient to maintain a head clearance now of 1200 millimeters. And that's de detailed in BS 5395. Um, you know, so often we see companionway ladders being used with a smaller hat, say a meter by meter. You're not gonna be able to get up here with, with that head clearance. You need to have sufficient head clearance to be able to use this type of ladder or even a retractable ladder that folds up and stored in a convenient location up, up above in the ceiling void. So we need to think about what ladder what size hatch and what we're going up there to do. And this is what Bilco can help you with. Make sure you go in the right direction at an early stage of your particular um, project. Recommendations for these. So height climbs, you know, a number of times we see height climbs above the three meters. So if you're up to three meter height climb, you could use a companion way ladder like this, no problem. Once you go above that three meters, 
you then need to introduce a rest platform. So you'd have a three metre climb rest platform and then you'd go up again to your desired height location. Um, so that's very important. As we move on, we've got plant access. So this was a hospital that we did. The only way to get this through this particular product, this scanner through the building was actually to go through the roof. So what we had to do is we had to make sure that we had our um, equipment access hatch. We've got, you can see a number of different compression springs this time to again, manually help somebody assist open, opening this. These can be manually operated or they can be electronically operated. So we can have a switch on the inside and then once you get back up onto the roof, these are ready to open and to crane your product into the, into the building itself. There's not normally any human traffic through these. So there's normally another access point on the roof. So another smaller access hatch for somebody to climb up, either manually open these or electronically open these. And then we can close these back down once we've finished. If powered or electrically operated, we can have rain sensors on these. We can have a number of different electronics to make sure this operates in the way that we want it to and efficiently. Okay, so for the installation of a fixed vertical ladder, the ladder must be positioned opposite the hinge side. So you can see this ladder is opposite the hinge side here. It's not on this side. You can imagine if the ladder was on this side, the hinge side, it would be impossible to gain access onto the roof. We can put the ladder here or we can put the ladder on these sides here as well. That's fine. And you can see there that we've got the ladder up safety post here as well. And you can just about see there that the ladder safety post it bolts around the top two rungs of the fixed vertical ladder. And we release this little yellow catch. We pull this up and it's very easy to lock into that open position so we can then climb up onto the roof. So moving on to fixed vertical ladders now. Um, so a fixed vertical ladder is for personal access only. So all we'd want to do is get up onto the roof on an infrequent basis, clean the gutters, that sort of thing. Um, these are made in aluminium. We used to do galvanized steel. We've stopped doing that now because a number of reasons really. Contractor pre prefers the weight of the aluminium, a lot easier to move around. And also galvanized steel has rocketed in price. So aluminium is a lot cheaper. Um, so yeah, once the aluminium's on site, it's a lot easier to move around. We can, we can do these bespokely. So we can make these to exactly what your project requires. We can have extended standoff brackets. We can have safety cage on these. So any ladder that's above the three meter climb, we need to introduce a safety cage that you see here. The safety cage would start anywhere sort of 2.2 meters up and then up to the total climb. And this is very important to note as well. Maximum single climb for a single ladder climb is 10 meters. So you could have a ladder like this with a safety cage starting at 2.2 up to the 10 meter mark up to your height climb. If you're going above the 10 meter climb, then what we need to do is reduce those um, climbs to six meters. You then have a rest platform here and then we could go up another six meters rest platform and another six meters until you get up to the required uh, height climb of, of the roof. Many architects or, or specifiers or contractors get that wrong. They think they can go up in 10. So they think you can have a 10 meter climb platform, 10 meter climb platform, you can't. If you're going above the 10 meters, reduce those climbs to six meters. That's really important. Ladders should be manufactured to EN 14975. We make our ladders ourselves. So we manufacture these in Wolverhampton, but all of our manufacturing is done. And uh, again, we, we offer a service that's bespoke to whatever the project requires. So that's that's really important. Moving on, so let's move, talk about natural smoke ventilation now. So there's three main types on the market, normally what you can choose from. So you can see here, we've got a single smoke ventilator here. We've got an offset actuator, which opens the single lid at 140 degrees. That's as per the re recommendations of the regulations. Um, and we've got a nice size structural opening here, which is 1260 by 1260. So we could use this particular smoke vent as um, access onto the bit onto the roof as well. So this could be a combined smoke ventilator and access hatch. There are some limits on that. We would only use a fixed vertical ladder with a uh, smoke vent because 
we don't want a retractable ladder there stored just below the, hat, the access hatch and smoke vent because that will detract from your one meter free vent area that's stopping the smoke from exiting the building which is obviously what we want it to do we want the smoke to escape to allow everyone to escape the building safely we also do a double um, smoke vent so this will achieve the 1.5 free vent area this will achieve a one meter free vent area and then we've got also our sliding sky vent so this is a nice structural opening of a meter by 1500 and this product will achieve the one meter free vent area the beauty of this is that because we've got a 1500 um, millimeter um, structural opening there we will achieve the head clearance so we could use a companionway ladder with this or we could use a fixed vertical ladder so they're your sort of three main options on the market there So we've got a quick video here. So this is Ayrshire College, and this is going to show you a smoke ventilator in full, full operation. Okay, so with natural smoke ventilation, we firstly need to comply with BSEN 12101. So all smoke vents need to comply and have its C marking badge. And um, automatic opening vents must have a battery backup or additional source of energy, providing at least 72 hours of battery backup. The vent needs to allow a minimum of one meter squared free ventilation area. Um, a number of times I've seen in the past where people think that to achieve your one meter free vent area, you need a structural opening of a meter by a meter. Unfortunately, smoke doesn't um, go around corners, it funnels. Um, so what we need to do, we need to increase that structural opening to achieve our one meter free vent area. So as I said, our, our, our um, smoke vents, our structural opening as standard is a minimum of 1260 millimeters by 1260 millimeters to achieve that one meter free vent area. So many times I've gone to site and they've cut the holes out of the roof at a meter by a meter. And unfortunately, because we haven't been involved at an early stage, we've had to say that that's not going to achieve your one meter free vent area. So yeah, please be aware of that. Um, but very importantly as well, and I always mention this, that you know, building owners, they need to be aware that they need to open and close these smoke vents because they are a matter of saving people's lives. You know, so often you go to a building and a smoke vent has not been opened, it's not been tested. Um, so that's another reason to have your smoke ventilator as another access onto the roof as well. You know, for an example of that, say the Skyman comes along, say to a hotel, they can't gain access to the roof. They'll go back down to reception, they'll report that they can't gain access to the roof. So it's just another test to make sure that this is operating correctly and safe at all times, which is really really important because they are as i say a matter of saving people's lives if there is a fire so that's the bilco side of the presentation done we're now going to move on to the profab 
access side of, of, of the presentation. So we're going to look at fire rated riser doors, we're going to look at access panels, and we're going to look at steel doors as well. So firstly, riser doors. I get asked this all the time, what is a riser door? Um, you know, it's basically a door to gain access to an electrical cupboard or a service duct that requires a large opening. You know, it's really an oversized access hatch and these are generally fire rated to gain access to space that you can't normally walk, walk into that you see here. Fire rated riser doors, they offer peace of mind. They're typically 30, 60 or 120 minutes fire rated. Um, but non-fire rated access panels and riser doors can also be specified for use in non-fire rated walls um, within a building where the structural area sits outside of the building fire envelope as well. So these are your traditional doors. So this is what you'd see in some of the older buildings now. So a traditional timber leaf and frame, the face material traditionally matches the doors throughout the building, timber veneer or paint and visible and protruding architrave, visible hinges. And it mentions there just at the bottom about the installation process, which actually for timber doors is longer. And the reason for that being is that your dry lining or your block work contractor will come in, they'll make your structure open in, then your carpenter will come in and they'll normally fit the frame, but they won't hang the doors. And they won't hang the doors for the simple reason is that they, they don't want them to get damaged through the rest of the completion of the build. So you've got there two trades originally installing the frame and the structural opening. You've then got the void left open, so non-fire rated during the rest of the completion of the build. And then about four or five weeks before the end of the build, your carpenter come along, comes along and hangs the timber doors. So you've got, you've got three visits there. You've got a significant period of downtime with your riser doors not hung or secure. How does that compare with steel risers? First things first, they're a lot much more, they're much more cleaner, they're tidier, as you can see from this image. And that's because they've been designed to remove all those unsightly elements that you have with standard timber door sets. So all of the mechanical elements like the hinges, the locks, all the relevant hardware is actually concealed within the door frame itself. On top of that, talking about installation, um, these are installed by your block work or your dry lining contractor. So they're installed by the same person who is actually doing the initial structural opening. So you've got one trade instead of two, you've got one visit instead of three, and most importantly, you've got completely secure fire rated product performance when they leave. So you don't have to worry about having your risers non-secure. So that's very important to get right. You know, obviously by specifying still modern riser doors that we see going into the majority of the new buildings now, you can alleviate all those concerns over and above what you would have with timber door sets. Okay, so now let's have a look at some examples. So this is actually our Profab 4000 series that you see here, and you've got two singles and a double there that you just see there. Um, now, the first big thing to point out is, is that the fact that you can't really see what you're looking for. You can just see that shadow gap there at the bottom of the door, and the doors are the same colour as the wall. Um, so we give you the option um, we can powder coat these ready to go to site, ready to fit. But the majority of contractors now want to paint these on site, the same color as the wall. So they completely mirror match. Um, so that's that's really important. Obviously, sometimes when you're powder coating them in a rail color and then you're painting the wall the same color, it does look slightly different. So that's that's really important. Another example there is, is how clean and tidy modern risers can be. We can see that this contractor has chosen the same color as the walls and painted these on site, which will look really nice, neat and tidy. You can see here at the top, um, we've used the standard riser door uh, where we've incorporated some architrave into it as well, just to make it consistent with the rest of the wall. The dogs on the uh, wall here give the project away. This was the Kennel Club, which was a nice project that we worked on. And then just below here, King's Cross R6, I think this project is. So this is a completely cladded solution. You can't really, again, work out where the riser door is, and that's for the simple reason that our 8000 series specified here, which is a completely cladded solution, and that completely conceals the door within the cladded solution of the building. So obviously architects love this. They can keep that visual effect. They can keep the corridor being fluid, smooth, and it's not as visual 
as having just a sort of a standard riser door there. So you can completely hide and keep the aesthetics in place with using this product. product. This is quite a good example. Um, so you can see this lady and gentleman here sat at a reception. And behind them, you've got two different tonal contrasts of tile. Now, again, actually, you know, unless you know what you're looking for, you can't really see the doors, but the doors here in this white marble, you can just see that Euro profile cylinder here. So you can make them, you know, really sort of hide. If you think about what would have been maybe a traditional timber door set behind them or a steel riser door set behind them, it would be really visual. So you can almost completely conceal these and maintain your aesthetic design with the project by using and selecting this particular product. So again, this is the Profab 8000 series. Again, we've got some examples of that 8000 series. Talking about finishes, you can use any timber, stone, tile, marble as a facing product. That's not a problem. Non-combustible material. Um, and that can be installed up to 25 millimeter thick on top of the face plate of the door using and we would upgrade to heavy gauge in system here. So obviously the weight massively increases using this product. The beauty of this is that if you have a sort of a bathroom pod or you need a smaller wall access panel, you can have this particular design and you can obviously, if you've got a tiled complete wall and you need an access for small access panel in it, you can use this product as well to keep it nice and clean. So within approved document B volume two of the building regulations, it states that any test evidence used to substantiate the fire resistance rating of a door should be carefully checked to ensure that it adequately demonstrates compliance and is applicable to the adequately complete installed assembly. And um, small differences in detail, such as glazing apertures, intermittent strips, door frames and ironmongery, etc., may significantly affect the rating. You know, to summarize those statements, it is important to read the supplied fire certificate certification and check that the cert certificate does cover the application in which the product is intended to be used. So, for example, some products may only be certified with a small aperture size, for example, 300 by 300 millimetres. However, on your project, you have specified you have been supplied a 1200 by 200 aperture. This certificate would therefore not cover your product. It is important to understand that changes from what has been tested, cert certified or assessed can massively affect the potential fire performance of a product. So moving on to sort of British European standards, you know, the main standards that you may or may not have heard of is BSEN 1634, um, and which takes pre precedence of the BS 476 part 22, which is the testing standard for doors. This is how the actual doors and panels are tested basically in, in instruction as an instruction manual. BS 476 part 31.1 is the test standard for smoke testing and BS 8214 relates to installation and a fire door set in more detail. European standard BS EN 1634 was originally created in 1999. Currently both standards BS 476 and the latest version BS EN 1634 one 2014 plus A1 2018 can be specified. The addition of BSEN 1634 2014 uh, and A1 2018 has been added to approved document B volume two to allow the use of it. So independent product conformity certification is supplied, for example, by certifier. So the scheme has four main documents and all for certain aspects of the scheme. The tamper evidence label is to identify the supplied product for both the customer and the certification scheme. The text on the labels may change due to the manufacturer and also shows the fire rating. Every label is unique and the number is locked. So for example, if you had a door on site and the certifier number was issued, you're able to trace the product back to the time it was built the project number, etc. So the product is fully traceable. The second item is the product data sheet. This is designed for general site use. It informs the installer and the end client about what you can and can't be done to the product. The third, the third item there is third party certificate. The fourth document is solely for the manufacturer and consists of all the key components of the product. Now, 
I'm going to show you a video here of a 30 minute fire test. So we've got three doors in the video. They're all being sold and installed on the market as 30 minute fire rated. But only one of these doors has been installed as per the original fire test. The other two have been provided with indicative performance products. So combined, they say they should work. But let's see what happens now in the video. It's almost immediately. Although this reduces on the central door B, it remains significant on the other two doors in the test. Almost immediately, cracking is heard coming from door A as heat reaches the glass. But after only four minutes, the glass dramatically fails and the door is engulfed in fire and smoke. Imagine if that door had been in a hotel corridor. The fire could have rapidly reached other parts of the building where occupants were trying to escape. A frightening situation. The door is sealed to allow the remainder of the test to continue. It's now five minutes into the test and the letter plate on door C falls out, setting fire to the outside of the door. Imagine if this was in a block of flats. Fire and smoke would spread down the corridor, endangering the lives of other residents, as well as causing a potential significant fire risk to the fire and rescue authorities. To continue the test, the burning letter plate is extinguished and the letter plate slot in the door is sealed. Our focus continues on door C, the door with no intumescent seals, which has not only allowed smoke to pour from its frame surrounds, but is now starting to glow red hot as the fire burns through from the edges. As this part of the test reveals, intumescent smoke seals are crucial in the installation of fire doors. Without them, not only is the fire rating of the door reduced by 50%, but by now, killer smoke would have been spreading to other parts of the building for over 50 minutes. The door is now sealed as we focus on door B, the remainder of the test. We're now approaching and then exceeding 30 minutes and our correctly glazed and correctly installed door is still holding back the fire, doing what it was designed and engineered to do. It's 33 minutes before this door finally gives out. The test complete the view from the fireside reveals more. You can see how doors A and C are completely burned through, threatening danger to the fire and rescue authorities, whilst the correctly installed door in the middle is charred but has remained intact. Remember, fire doors are not ordinary doors. They're engineered fire safety devices. Their correct installation and maintenance is vital in preventing fire and smoke from spreading, saving property, and protecting life. Okay, so why is the middle door, door blank B, there past and exceeded 30 minutes fire rating? Well, it's been installed completely as per the original fire test, including every single element within that document. The other doors, A and C, have, have had combined products, so both of them independently say that they should perform to 30 minutes, but you can see there that actually in a real life fire the, with that environment, they've actually failed. So how do we make sure that we don't allow or fall into this particular trap? Here's just some examples of the fire testing and fire doors that can be tested from, from one side or both sides. So we do a huge amount of testing there and we make sure that our products have third party accreditation. So we've gone to a third party, we've made sure that they've assessed or retested our products and our fire test and they give us another certificate for that to make sure that we've gone that extra step to make sure that we've actually provided a product that's safe and will actually do what it needs to do in that environment of the fire. We're gonna move now on to the sort of frame options that are available uh, on the market. So we've got the architrave, if that's required, um, picture frame for Remedy Works, um, beaded frame for normal um, that requires a plaster skim, We've got a deep plaster frame there, and then we've got a Dutch fold required getting close into those corners as well. 
Recess options um, are available using a recess plimp, set back skirting. Um, signage disc can be applied if required, such as fire door keep locked or a riser door reference number. Um, locking options can be chosen from a budget lock to high security lock. Locking positions can be set to certain requirements as well. Um, a number of questions that I get for this is that obviously with a number of different sizes that we've seen here, we've got riser doors without any fire signage on. Um, you can't see the Euro profile cylinder. How do we open these doors? But you can see here that we have some locking options here. So this particular plate, which is the same color as the door itself, we can remove this magnetic plate with a sucking tool that you see here. And then that gives you access into the sort of tool key and your profile. So you've been able to hide these from the door face. And the fire door key lock sign, once these doors are open, normally building control will assist that you have on the leading edge of the door when it once opened a fire door keep lock sign. That's how you get away with having a fire um, signage on the face. It's always good to speak to building control when they're involved of what they believe should be should be fitted. You know, they will be able to steer you in the right direction. Building control, they're all very different. It depends who you're speaking to, what location. So it's always good to speak to the building control and find out if you can have the lollipop sign on the leading edge as, as, as fascia, as a signage. Um, and they're able to use these concealed locks that you see here as well. OK, so moving on to access panels here. So again, very much like riser doors. They're for wall and ceiling applications. They're clean, they're concealed, designed to be completely maintenance free. And they tend to be assessed in such as mechanical and electrical services as well. So much like your riser doors, extremely easy to decorate, paint over. And as mentioned, you can have these in tiled versions as well. Moving on to steel door sets now. Um, so the, you know, the advantages of steel doors, well, against timber door sets, they have a high level of performance. They're fire tested as a complete door set and they cover a wide range of designs. Um, one of the big benefits of steel doors over timber door sets is their structural integrity. Um, now, the next time you're in a school or hospital, take a look down their corridor, have a look at their door sets. You'll always normally see they, they're a 54 mil thick double timber door set. Um, but you will find that there is a magnetic hold open device at the top of the door, not the base. Now, this is the building control and maintenance teams demanding this because you don't want them to get damaged. That being said, it can lead to the doors to warp. If the doors warp, then they're not fire rated and they need replacing. So always think about using steels. Steel door sets will not warp. If you put a magnetic hold open device and door closer at the head, so select the right product you need and this will save time and money and you won't have a major problem in replacing the doors as, as we go down the line. OK, so this now brings me on to the, the last bit of the presentation, which is going to touch on floor access. Um, so this is part of the Howl Green side of the business. And as I said, we do a huge amount on, in transport and um, airports and underground um, for, for, for floor access for Howl Green. But we just want to talk about what you need to consider. Um, there's a multitude of different usages. Um, as we see here, we go through the different sort of aspects of this. We've got swimming pool there. We've got an external application where we've got a full multi-part unit filled, filled with concrete. Uh, I believe this is sort of tower bridge here. This has got an engine underneath here. So we can remove all of these panels one by one. We've got beams here, as structural beams here that can be removed. And we can then get to the engine to make sure we can do any maintenance or if we need to replace the engine, we can lift this out, put it back and we can get these panels back in and open up to the product, the, the public as, as fast as we possibly can. We can do hinged um, floor access as well. We might need ladder access down here. You can just see this ladder here. So it works very similar to the uh, reef access hatches that we've seen. And it might be a full electrical duct that we need to implement here into the floor so we can remove all of these panels that you can see here. These have been filled with the same finish as the, uh, the floor surrounding it as well. Floor finishes available, so granite, wood, terrizzo, ceramic, vinyl, tread clay and exterior applications as well. 
Um, the clear depth of the recess must be considered when specifying the cover. So not only the loading requirement, um, as an example, you may need to use a medium or a heavy duty cover to accommodate a deeper stone, even though it is to be installed in an area used by pedestrian foot traffic. Um, there's a cover that will accommodate every type of flooring, but consideration has to be made to what the environment is going to be. So it's all to do with what's going over this. And the last that's the tread plate finish as well that we do a lot of pumping stations with. This is that Tower Bridge product again with a concrete infill. So what do you need to think about when looking for floor panels? So there's six major considerations. If you combine these, you'll select the right product. So it's all about what's the weight loading. Is it, is it pedestrian? Is it cars? Is it light vehicles? Is it heavy duty? You know, 6.5 tonne lorry. What configuration do you want? Um, is it a single part cover, duct cover? Is it lastly a multi-part cover? So taking these six points into consideration, you'll then select the right product accordingly, and we can help with that. So light duty products, you know, they're for light duty pedestrian traffic only, sort of interior and exterior applications, um, have about 90 kilograms per square metre, optional one hour fire rated versions, and they're triple sealed. Um, these are your low traffic, normal footfall traffic areas. If you want something a bit more industrial, and heavier footfall, we need to move to our medium duty floor covers. Now these take a very large weight, you know, up to five, five ton rule load. Um, so heavy delivery vehicles to a commercial premises, approximate weight, 155 kilo, kilograms per square meter. And these can be up to three hours fire rated and they're double or triple seal, sealed. So medium duty covers, they're suitable for places like su supermarkets, indoor shopping centers, sports and athletic centers, car showrooms, that type of thing. And then moving on to heavy duty panels, you know, suitable for internal or external environments, subject to heavy pedestrian or um, vehicle traffic, you know, covering such as granite, um, the use of support beams and cross members enables that complex designs to be manufactured and accommodate situations where a non-standard access solution is required. So again, these are manufactured in Wolverhampton in our headquarters, and it's a very, very bespoke product. It's, as you can see here, we've got very, very small lifting points here. So we'd unscrew these screws and we can lift these panels out. We've taken the time to speak to the tiler as well to see what size the tiles that they're using. So we can actually manufacture a product that's going to sit within this and, and make sure that we haven't got pieces of tile in the corner that over time is going to move and crack. This looks, this is a very good example of using floor access and keeping the aesthetics for the architect and the client as well. We want to try and hide these. We don't want to see them. and We want to try and keep the floor finish as fluent as possible. So we do a huge amount of obviously wood access covers as well. So any timber floor up to 22 mil solid hardwood floors. Um, the, 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 you know, we've got such flexibility product here that it doesn't really matter what your floor finish is. We have a product to, to accommodate that. Floor access doors available in aluminium or steel. Um, they're fire rated. They can be heavy duty, light duty. Um, We've got a video coming up here just to show you how sort of heavy duty they can be, but also give that sort of flexibility for that manual user to be able to open and close these correct. The last thing you want for these is to open and go all the way past and, and obviously smash the hinges off. Also, when you're closing them, you don't want them to slam. So just like those roof access hatches that we saw with the compression springs, these work in exactly the same way. So this is the biomass boiler dome project. This poor chap has to come along every day, open these access hatches, floor doors and, and deliver his product. You can see here the sort of size of the compression springs with these doors. And you can see the balance there of being able to close those. It takes the weight and makes it very easy for that gentleman to be able to close these and lock them off and away he goes. This gentleman has got a lot of floor doors to open each day. This one over time has just sort of seized up, hasn't got the right compression springs on it. it. Takes two of them to be able to fully open this to get to what he needs to get to. So we came along and we installed 
a new floor door with the right compression springs. And you can see how, how much easier that is to open and close, makes his life a little bit easier. Again, this is that uh, multi-part unit that we saw. Um, so this is obviously still there today. It's, 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 it's done really well. It's been used many a time. They've taken all of these panels out and the cross beams, put them back together, and it just enables them to be able to annually look at this engine and make sure that it's operating correctly when it, when it needs to open the bridge for the taller boats. So this was quite a nice case study that we did. We've done a lot at Buckingham Palace. We've done some at Manchester United Football Ground. We've done some really nice projects, especially recently. This was that Glasgow, Glasgow Transport Museum where we used that access hatch and cladded the top lid to make sure it blends in with the rest of the roof. And again, there's that Blair Castle pitch roof access hatch as well that we've done. Riser doors at 100 Cheapside, London. You can see again how clean, maintenance free, how easy these look. Building control have assisted there that they want the fire door keep locked on the face. And we can see there that we've got a Euro profile and, and a budget lock there as well to be able to open these doors and lock them off. Riser doors at 20 Fenchurch Street, walkie talkie. Um, again, we use a cladded, full cladded solution here, our Profab 8000 series. And then tiled riser doors again uh, to blend into your building environment. So, this was a good example of that full cladded version as well. Kennel Club again, we've seen that one. And then we've got the Aberdeen pumping station. We do a huge amount of external pumping stations, part of the Howell Green range as well. And then we've got some case studies here for Howell Green. So this was the um, underground station that we did. You can see that multi-part unit and we've got some single covers here as well, which again, blend in with the design of the floor. And then we've got the last one there of Crossrail. You can just see some floor doors here into these access. So we can open these up and all the electrics for these barriers are underneath that we can get to. So thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I think we've got around about sort of five minutes for questions. Has have we had any questions, Shanika, at all? And um, we have. So the first one is uh, should not the vent open foul safe means in case of any failure should happen. Okay, so that that probably means that we're talking about the smoke ventilation units there so obviously the, the smoke vents will have battery backup to them so 72 hours assisted battery backup so if there's a, a fail or anything like that these will operate for 72 hours battery backups and that's part of the regulations as well okay. so hopefully that op opens that In case of battery break what options is available um <sighs> I suppose, you know, if battery break, we've never had that before. Um, but yeah, I mean, th th there is no other option for, th for that. These are powered and we've got 72 battery, 72 hours battery backup. We would suggest that you check the batteries every sort of six months to 12 months. But yeah, I mean, that that is part of the regulations and standards. And, and that is, is, is the requirement of that, of having that 72 hours battery backup. Um, anonymous attendee. Where riser doors have been designed to be virtually invisible, are there any challenges with maintenance accessibility? Do your designs incorporate any indication to enable easier accessibility? Or is the client responsible to communicating any floor plans prior to site survey? You know, these, these are being used by people that will know how to use these. Um, they will be only used by official people that would have the operation to be able to open and close these. Um, we would go on site if there's any issues with installation. Um, if it's a subcontractor who isn't used to using our particular product, we would go to site and assist them to make sure it's installed and correctly um, operated. Um, but yeah, these, these are not operated by people that wouldn't know how to open and close them. It would be people that are sort of used to opening and closing these and understanding where they are and what what they need to be locked off to as well. Um, last one, what are the waterproofing details for the floor access panels, thanks? 
Um, if I can have your details, I can send you some information on that and we can give you some drawings to sort of give you that. We've got a huge amount of different waterproofing details that can be, that can be provided to you. Can the smoke vents be opened manually if any fact? Yes, they can. They can be opened manually from above using a particular tool. So that's not a problem either. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Tom. And I want to say thank you for everyone who has joined us this morning. Just to remind you that this session has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel very soon. If you have any feedback on this webinar or any topic suggestions you would like to see us cover, please get in touch. If you would like to host a webinar for pay, again, please let us know. And with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you again, Tom, for your time. And thank we'll you. see you all next month. Thank you all.